May, can I tell me here? 9-11. Did you know there's nothing special going in Washington, D.C. on that 20th day? And I was just told that on September the 11th, Sean Foyt, who's been going all over this nation doing worship, is going to be at the mall in Washington doing worship. Is that not crazy? That's crazy good. That's so awesome. That's so awesome. Amen. So, praise God. Praise God. So, Tristan is looking at me right now on a video from Coronado, California. And I'm just going to say this. I'm not saying, I'm not bringing that up because he's here. Except, son, I want you to hear what I'm going to say today. Because I think it's really important. I'm telling you, as a pastor, sometimes you literally want to say, kids, I want you to listen to this, okay? Uh, you may not be at every service, but this is the one I want you to hear. And I believe that we live in an hour that we, as the people of God, need to operate and walk in the truth of God. Amen? L let me tell you why. Because the Bible tells us that in the last days there is going to be great delusion. The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be even the elect could be deceived. And so how many of you know that God wants us to walk and operate in truth? The tr if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. And here's the thing about, here's the thing about truth, and here's the thing, and, and, and this is the best way I can describe it, but, but if I was on a ship, in fact, let's just say that you were on one of those sailboat ships, you know, that, that can go out to sea, okay? If we were on one of those ships and we left Coronado, California, and our destination was the Hawaiian Islands, okay? Our destination was the Hawaiian Islands. If I left Coronado, California, and I was half a degree off, just half a degree, Paul, how many of you know that when I thought I would be arriving at the Hawaiian Islands, I would miss the whole thing? And I'd be going, where in the world are the islands, right? That's an illustration of being on a ship. What if I was on a spaceship? What if I was flying into space and I was half a degree, not a degree, not three degrees, but half a degree off? Listen, I would be lost in space. And I said this last night. I, doesn't, I don't have this in my notes, but it just came to me and... When I said the word last night, I would be lost in space. All I did was go like this. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger, danger, Will. Ro Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Because if you do, you get an old man. Danger, Will Robinson. And so we as a people of God, we as a people of God need to have an understanding of the character of God. And one of the dynamics about God is the justice of God. And it's, it's something that is not talked about often today. We, we hear a lot about the grace of God or the love of God, but we do not hear about the justice of God. And I believe as a minister of the gospel and as a teacher of God's word that I'm going to be held accountable twice as much as you. And so I have to teach the entire counsel of God. And it's something that probably 100 years ago we heard a lot of, but it's not mentioned that much anymore, is the justice of God. And so, you know what? God requires that justice. We hear about social justice. Amen? How many of you know that there is a justice of the kingdom of God, there is a justice of the character of God, and God requires us as his people to walk in that justice? I'm going to go as far as to say, if we would truly walk in that justice, there would not need or be a social justice. In fact, Micah chapter 6 verse 8. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says this. Is it on the screen? He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord, what? Require. Isn't that a big word? What does the Lord require of you? But to do what? But to do justly, to of mercy, and to walk humbly before your God. God requires justice because God 
is a God of justice and God is just. Now, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Let me just say this real quick to you guys. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. I'm going to read three or four verses on the justice of God, okay? Now, the reason I'm going to do that is because I want to lay a foundation that God is a just God. But I want you to understand that there is over 140 verses that describe God as being just. And there's over 500 verses that literally elude to the justice of God. So here's the point. When I say that we're going to look into the justice of God, we could spend till Christmas doing this. Amen? But I'm just going to give you a few right now. Isaiah verse 30, pardon me, chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait. Now, I want you to catch, I want you to be a biblical student, and I, I want you to catch how many aspects of God's love and grace is found in this verse right here. And as, as I, I ask you to do that, I want you to understand that Isaiah chapter 30 and you're going to find this a lot of times. Isaiah chapter 30 eludes, well, it doesn't elude, it just is. Isaiah 30 is a chapter talking about God's judgment. Okay? We don't have time to read the whole thing, but Isaiah 30 talks about the judgment of God. Look with me at verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait, he will be patient, that he may be what? Gracious to you. And therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. He's a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. Now, Isaiah chapter 61, we're going to look at verse 8. We're going to work our way backwards for just a second. But Isaiah chapter 61, verse 8, look what it says. For I, the Lord, what does he love? Justice. I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting that people say, well, now God's just a God of love. God's just a God of love. But God, think about this. God is a God of love, but if he has the capacity to love, does he also have the capacity to, huh? If he has the capacity to have joy, the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. If, if God within himself has the capacity to operate and have joy, does he not also have the capacity to operate in anger? So here we see that God says, I love justice. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth, and I will make with them an everlasting covenant. Now look with me at verse 7, because we see here that God loves justice. He's a lover of justice. He's a hater of robbery. But look what verse 7 says, because now we see the justice of God Everybody, we're looking at the justice of God. And with God saying that he loves justice, what does verse 7 say? Instead of your shame, you shall have what? We're talking about justice here. Hey, isn't this cool? Instead of your shame, you shall have double honor. Instead of confusion, they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore, in their land, they shall what? Possess double. Everlasting joy will be theirs. And then verse 8 says, For I am God and I love justice. Isn't that some good stuff, man? I mean that God is a God of justice and God wants to take my shame and bless me with double honor. Isn't that awesome? Because God is a just God. Now, I'm going to say something to you and pace your anger. Pace your anger because this is going to sound sacrilegious. But I want to show you something here. Now, watch this. If God did not operate in justice, if God was not moved by justice, 
then his throne would topple. That sounds sacrilegious. If God is not, if he does not operate in justice, then his throne would topple. Look with me at Psalm 97, verse 2. Psalm 97, verse 2. Clouds and darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are what? What is righteousness and justice? The foundation of his throne. God's foundation is based on righteousness and justice. Okay, go with me. Go with me to Psalm 89, and we're going to look at the blessings of justice, but look at Psalm 89. We're going to start at verse 14. We're going to read to verse 18. Righteousness, here it is again, guys. Righteousness and justice are the what? Foundation of your throne. Now, when I was a kid living in a big city, there were times that I would be in the downtown area, and I can remember that you would walk down a sidewalk and you could hear the machines and uh, the jacks going and the cranes moving. You could hear. And so because I was a kid, I knew that if I climbed up on this big wooden wall that I'd only get in trouble for a second. Okay? So I would climb up on the wall to see them building a new skyscraper in Dallas, Texas. And I can remember when I'd get to the top of the wall, I would look down and literally these machines would literally be like 10 stories down in the earth digging that out. And I was so amazed. I, I figured they would already be building a building right on the ground. But, but those skyscrapers were so tall and so big that they had to go way, way down in the earth to establish the foundation. Now watch this. A foundation will always do two things. It will always determine the strength and the size of the building. Let me say that again. The foundation will always determine the strength and the size of the building. In fact, I can put it to you like this. If you feel like you're getting jackhammered, you feel like you're getting tore apart, you feel like you're having an excavator dig down into your soul and it ain't feeling good and it ain't fun, it's probably because God's working on your foundation trying to establish you so He can really build something and make something of you. Because that digging and all that pain and all that jackhammering is making you something that God intends you to be that you've never dreamed that you would be. We can all go home right now. I mean, we just... Now, we're going back to this again. Think about it. And the kingdom of God, the creator of the universe, His foundation is righteousness and what? Justice. How many think that would be a pretty important thing to understand and know? The justice of the Lord. Amen? Now we're going to look at this. Look at the benefits. Look at the blessings of justice. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. You see the blessings for walking under the justice of God? They walk, O oh Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. And in your righteousness they are what? Exalted. For you are the glory of their strength. And in your favor our horn is exalted. For our shield belongs to the Lord. Our King is the Holy One of Israel. How many have seen in that portion of Scripture that with the justice of the Lord comes blessings for those who follow Him? Now, what we want to do is we want to understand the justice of the Lord a little better. So we're going to go back to the beginning. In your Bible, and you'll see where I'm going with this. At first, I may say this, you might be like, what? But in your Bible, there is a Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, first chapter in the Bible, verse 27, and it tells us how we were created. And we, to understand justice, we got to understand how we were created. So God created what? Man in His what? Own 
image. We were created in the image of God. He created him, male and female. He created them. So God made us in his image. Amen? So now let's look at the very first place in the Bible that we see the word justice. Go with me to uh, Genesis chapter 18, and we're going to start in verse 16. Now, a minute ago, we were looking at uh, Isaiah 30, and we were looking at this scripture that was talking about God was patient, and he was gracious, he was merciful, and he was, he was a God of justice. But in that chapter, we also see that he is literally proclaiming judgment, okay? So it, it's just interesting as a, as, as a Bible student, sometimes I'm like, wow, there's, there's some correlations here. And even, Devin, in the correlation, sometimes I think there's some truth. And here's the point. This is the first time we see the word justice in Genesis 18. Does anybody know in the chapter of Genesis verse, or chapter 18 what is about to happen? Abraham is sitting under a shade tree and he sees three angels coming. I believe one of them was Jesus, okay? Abraham sees three angels coming, and you know what they're coming for? Let, let's check it out. Then the men rose from there, and they looked towards Sodom. What was, what was going to happen? Abraham sees him coming and he runs to him. And he goes, could you stay with me for a moment? Could you sit under the shade tree? Could I, he literally goes, could I wash your feet? Would you, would you take a cake? And they go, yes, we will. And he runs to his wife, Sarah, and he says, Sarah, he said, make some cakes. He runs to a servant. He says, kill a fatted calf. He runs to another servant. He says, get some fresh milk. And as they are sitting there with Abraham under this shade tree, this is where literally... That Sarah in the tent hears the angel of God say, about this time next year, your wife is going to have a baby. And she, as an older woman, says, hearty har, har, har. <laughs> and the angel of God hears her laughter and says, why are you laughing? And she goes, she's in the tent. I didn't know you could hear through that little thin canvas. Come on. And then probably Abraham said, you don't know how loud you, never mind. So the angel hears her laughing and the angel says, is there anything too hard for God? Just an incredible place of scripture. And they arise from this time of eating with Abraham and Sarah and blessing them, and now they're on their way to where? Sodom. The men arose from there. They looked towards Sodom, and Abraham, with, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation... And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now here's the key. I want you to check this out. For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him. That they would keep the way of the Lord. To do righteousness. This is the first time it's mentioned. To do righteousness and what? Justice. And that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. Now, in my Bible, I have written four things in Genesis chapter 18, verse 19. And I want to share them with you real quick. Number one, we see that the angels of God, Jesus, the Lord of heaven, is saying, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? And then look at verse 19. For I have known him in order that he, and number one, that he may command, that he may teach his children. You see that? Then he's going to teach his children. How many of you believe that we should teach our children righteousness and justice? Can I say something to you today? Do you understand that even psycholo psychologically, psychologists say that racism is not inerrant or innate, but it is a learned behavior? And here's 
we see the God of heaven saying, this is the founder, this is the man that will be the father of a great nation. And he says, all the nations of the earth are going to be impacted and affected affected by him and I'm pouring my covenant on him because he's going to teach his children the commands of God and this is what he says number two to keep look what it says right there that they may keep the way of the Lord isn't that cool <laughs> to teach our children to keep the way of the Lord and then he says these two words what are we going to teach him now he's getting detailed righteousness and what justice so i want to talk to you for just a moment i want to give you the definition of righteousness so that's the third thing i've got marked in my bible in verse 18. this is what righteousness means it's the hebrew word to dusk and it means to be right to be made right it means virtue righteous acts justice that's the definition to be right, to be made right, righteous acts, virtue. Just, he's saying to teach your children this. But that's not the end of the verse. The end of the verse says this. Rectitude, to make right an error. So it's not just righteous acts, but it's to rectify and make right when we get out of line. I, I, I don't want to get too detailed with this, but some of you have heard this before. I was thinking about it this week. I was talking to my sister. I didn't know her story. But I remember as a little boy in Greeley, Colorado, and I remember walking into a Safeway. And my mother was shopping in the produce area buying vegetables because she was kind of a healthy type person. And they used to put in the produce at the Safeway in Greeley, Colorado, Brock's Candy. Oh, yeah. You remember Brock's Candy? Anybody here remember Brock? It's kind of dating you, but do you remember Brock's Candy? And I remember going in there, and I was about five, and I walked over there, and my weakness was the caramel candy. I wasn't into the hard candy. I liked the caramel candy. Give me that. And I was looking at that caramel candy. Now, keep in mind, keep in mind, I wasn't a man yet. So I was looking at the caramel candy. Amen? When I turned 18, I was still looking at the caramel candy. <laughs> I was looking at that caramel candy, and I knew if I went over to my mom and I went, Mama, get me some caramel candy. I knew that she'd say, No, it's got sugar in it. It's bad for you. You need to eat an apple. So I didn't even go talk to her about it. All of a sudden, my hand reached up. I grabbed a caramel candy. I had that candy in my hand, and I looked around, and I noticed that underneath was, there was like this, like something draped under the cabinet or the counter, and so I slid under there. Nobody could see me, Brittany. Nobody could see me. I was sitting there, and I was holding that caramel candy oh my, in my hand, and, and I did the little clear plastic. And I put it in my mouth and I started chewing and eating and putting it. And all of a sudden I could see the flames of hell lapping around me, man. You have stolen. I couldn't hardly get that out of my teeth. I ran to my mom. I go, Mom, I have stolen. I mean, I confessed to her. My mom says, Do you have the wrapper? I go, it's under the she goes, Go get the wrapper and I'll buy that candy for you. I told my sister that story this week. My older sister, she laughed at me. Then she told me her story. She did the same thing. But she was with daddy. And when she went to daddy, you know what he did to her? He said, well, we're going to the manager right now. He took her by the hand. He took her to the manager. And he said, sir... She stole candy. Would you like to get a squad car to come and pick her up? I'm glad I went to mama and not with daddy. How many of you know that rectified a wrong in her life? Now, if he would have done that to me, I would have literally, I'm breaking and I'm running, man. I'm getting out of here. 
Amen. <laughs> Again, righteousness. To make right, to be virtuous, to do a righteous act. Or to rectify an error of my way. Listen to what else this word for righteousness means. Check this out. Ethical standard of right relationships. Ethical standards of right relationships between people. Now, this is key. This is key. Treating others as the image of God. That blows racism. That blows critical race theory. That blows social justice right out of the... Listen, we don't need a humanistic form of justice. What we need is the word of God and God's justice that we would treat anyone of any nationality, any skin color as the image of God. If we would do that, wouldn't it, would that not eliminate racism? Treating others as the image of God. That's how God said, Abraham... Teach your children the commands, how to keep the ways of the Lord. Teach them how to be righteous. But what I really want to focus on is justice. Can I focus on justice for a moment? The word for justice in the Hebrew is mishpat. And it means something totally different than righteousness. In fact, as I have pondered this for a few weeks, sometimes the Lord begins to stir in me weeks or even months things before I share with you. And I was pondering this fact. I think I was on the airplane flying home and I was literally thinking to myself, just watch this for a moment. But I was thinking, Lord, do you have a dual character? Is it? And I'm thinking about God, Kelly, and I'm like, maybe it's a dual nature of God. But the more I studied, I'm like, it's not a dual nature. It's just the very essence of justice. Look what the word for justice, mishpat, means. A verdict, favorable or unfavorable. A judicial sentence. That's justice. On one side, the sentence could be unfavorable. I'm not going to get into detail, but I was kind of picking on my sister. She was laughing because she spent two years of her life in a Dallas County jail called Lou Starrett. And the irony about that, it's a little different than Montana, but the irony of that is here's this high-rise jail in downtown Dallas, and on the other side of the highway are these high-rise apartments that cost four grand a month to live in. So I was like, boy, you were doing high class up here when you lived in downtown Dallas. You know, she goes, boy, I was, what now, man? It was high cotton on that, you know, concrete floor. I go, did you wave at your neighbors across the highway? We were just having a good time. Here's the thing. When she was there, the verdict for her life was 99 years to life. She was experiencing what we would call an unfavorable verdict but then look at it like this and I shared this last night and when I shared this somebody said this is the best preaching I have ever heard in my life so this is what I'm gonna just give you an illustration what if you were done wrong what if you had been cheated on you had been lied on and you had been robbed from Tori what if what if there were those that had lied on you, cheated on you, tried to take things from you, and so you stood before a judge, and the sentence wasn't an unfavorable sentence, but watch this. What if the sentence was, because of the wrong that you have done to him, we are claiming that you pay him $22 million. This is where the gentleman last night said, this is the best preaching I've ever heard. But what if the verdict was for you to receive $22 million of restitution from this major corporation? Would not you consider that a favorable verdict? Did we not read a while ago that the justice of God brings from shame to honor? 
that the justice of God brings land and a double portion. I would call that a favorable verdict. Amen? So it's a judicial dynamic of justice or mishpat. Now, let me finish the definition. I, I, I've got to move on. We're, I'm not going to keep you too long, but only four more hours. But <laughs> this dynamic of justice first is considered. Now watch this. A retributive justice. When, when we hear of the justice of God, it's twofold, just like justice. It's a retributive justice. And that literally means if you do wrong, you pay the consequence. And then there's this justice of God. It's called the restorative justice. It means seeking out the hurting and restoring them. So there's this dynamic of retributive justice. You pay for the consequence of God. And then there's this dynamic of God that says, my justice is restor restorative and I want to take that person that is broken and wounded and downtrodden and I want to lift them up and I want to help them and I want to bless them. Let me read to you a couple of scriptures on that again. And I'm going to go ahead and just skip Luke 19. I want to go to Proverbs 31 and I want to read to you. This is the dynamic Proverbs chapter 30, 31, verses 8 and 9. And in my Bible, right next to Proverbs chapter 31, right at verse 8 and 9, I literally have wrote in my Bible, the pro-life movement. This is what I have in my Bible right here. Look, at this is the justice of God, and this is the restorative justice, this restoring justice of God. Open your mouth for who? The speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth and do what? Judge righteously. This is that restorative justice. And plead the cause of who? The poor and the needy. Amen. If we would be a people that would operate in this kind of justice, Boy, howdy, would it change things. Amen? This mishpat, this justice of God. Let me read another verse to you. Go to Jeremiah 22, and we're going to look at verses 3 and 5. Jeremiah 3 through 5. Jeremiah 20, 22, verses 3 through 5. Look at this again. This is that dynamic of the justice of God. There's a restorative justice, and there's a retributive justice. Thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plundered out of the hand of who? Go and find those that are being oppressed and go and deliver them from the hands of the oppressor. Do no wrong nor do or do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of his house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall be what? Become a desolation. So here in verse 3, we see restorative justice. But in verse 5, we see if we turn, if we will not listen, if we will not heed, that there is a retribute. If you overlook the oppressed, if you let them die in the streets, and you go and do your own thing, do not think that they will come riding on horses for you to bring desolation to your house. Restorative justice retributive justice go with me to psalm 146 verses 5 through 9 psalm 146 verses 5 through 9 i'm gonna have you out of here quick guys psalms 146 verses 5 through 9 look at this happy is he who has the god of jacob for his help whose hope is in the lord his god who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for who? There's that. 
Ruth, there's that restorative justice. Who executes justice for the oppressed. Who gives food to the hungry. There it is again, mishpat. The Lord gives freedom to prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over strangers. He relieves the fatherless and the widow. Is that not restorative justice? But the way of the wicked, he turns upside down. There is the retributive justice of God. A few weeks ago, I, uh, yes, I'm a tightwad. You just saw that. I didn't, want, I didn't want to dirty a handkerchief, so I'm using paper towels. So. A few weeks ago, this was already, already on my heart. Pastor Josh went to Great Falls to be with family and his father-in-law, so he asked me to minister to the youth. And I gave this illustration to the youth, and the whole room was full of teenage guys. And there was just a couple of girls in there, but it was mainly guys. And so I gave this illustration, they laughed at me. And Bonnie, I realized I'm getting older and I'm not as cool as Pastor Josh, so, you know. But I want you to be in this role. I want you to be this person. I asked these teenagers in the youth service, I said, how many of you would think as your pastor that I try to live out a righteous life and be a righteous man? All the guys were like, yep. How many of you believe that I walk in justice? Yep, you're just, you're a righteous man, you're our pastor. Kawabunga, hang ten, you know, foxy lady. I don't know. I don't know why that came out of my mouth just now. I think 70s just shot out, the Bee Gees just shot out of my... Tragedy! Okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> They just love me through it. <laughs> but I looked at the guys and I said, you would believe that I, I'm a righteous man, I'm a just man. Yes, yes, yes. And I go, okay, so, and now I want you to play this part in this scenario. What if there were those that were out to get you? And so there were five people, and they were beating you. They were kicking you. They were knocking you to the ground. They were hitting you. You were being beaten up bad. And the outcome and the result of you being beaten is you were put into a coma in the hospital. Everybody relate? And as they began to beat you and kick you, you looked, and on the street, you saw Pastor Paul walking towards you on the street. And so you said, help, help. And as I got closer, and with every ounce of energy and with all the oxygen in your lungs, you yelled, help. And when I was close enough to do something, I turned my head and I kept walking by. And I never, I just, while you were being kicked, while you were being beaten, you were a victim of this wrongdoing. You were a victim of this injustice. You were a victim of this. When you called out for help, I just turned my head, looked the other way, and walked by. I turned and I looked at teenagers and I said, would I be a righteous man? Would I be just if I did that? And every one of those teenagers, teenagers said, absolutely not if I turn my head from the crime if I turn my head from the abuse if I turn my head from the sin would I be considered righteous would I be considered just so now the question is we're not talking about Pastor Paul anymore we understand as the Word of God teaches that God is a just God. Can God as a just God turn His head and look the other way from sin? Can God as a just God act like it isn't existing or it isn't there? Can God do that? Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 19. Deuteronomy 
27, 19. Look what it says. Cursed is the one who does what? Perverts the justice. This is coming right from God. He's teaching his people and he goes, if anyone perverts justice, cursed is the one who perverts justice due to the stranger, the fatherless, the widow. And all the people shall say amen. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 15. Look what it says. Proverbs 17, 15. Proverbs 17, verse 15. That's a good verse. I ought to preach on it someday. But Proverbs 17, 15. Look what it says. We're talking about God here. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just. He who just turns his head and acts like he doesn't see it. He justifies the wickedness, but yet he condemns the just. Look what it says. Both of them are like what? That's a big word, isn't it? Both are alike. They are an abomination to the Lord. Do you know what the word abomination is? Can I tell you? I looked it up. I know what the word means. But I wanted to know what the Webster's Dictionary said. What abom Because he's saying, you who justify the wicked and you who condemn the just, you're like an abomination. And I looked up the word abomination. You know what it is? It means this. Loathsome. Hated. Disgusted. God himself, as a God of justice, looks at someone that would pervert justice as wicked, as loathsome, as disgusting. I'm going to close. We're going to jump back into this next week. But could it be, now follow me, could it be that we would see more miracles more healings, more signs and wonders if we as a people of God really understood the justice of God. Now think of that for a moment because how is in the world is he correlating justice to miracles? Could it be if we really understood the justice of God that we would see more of the manifestation of God? I read this a minute ago. I'm going to read this again. But Psalm 146 verse 7 says, The Lord executes justice on the oppressed. Think about someone that has an infirmity. Think about someone that has been plagued with an illness or a sickness. They didn't bring it on themselves. They didn't cause it. But they were attacked by the adversary. They were attacked by the enemy. Instead of just praying, God, heal them, God, heal them. What if we begin to say, God, render justice on the oppressor and execute judgment on the oppressor and bring healing to my brother or sister? Lord, they didn't bring this on themselves. They didn't cause this on themselves. They just stepped into it and they were attacked by this infirmity or this illness. Lord, I pray for justice from heaven to come now and set that plundered, set the oppressed free and bring justice to the adversary. Isn't that amazing? If we, because remember what justice is, it's nothing more than a ju just judicial legal verdict. God, bring justice to that person that has experienced that heartache, that pain, and that hurt. Luke 18, verses 1 and 8, we're going to close. Six months ago, I shared this with the church. We were talking about encouragement in prayer. It's the aspect of it, okay? So, now look at this. This verse, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, literally is an encouragement in prayer. It's also a scripture that talks about our faith and being strong in faith. It's a scripture that also, also talks about the persistence of prayer. But when you really break it down... It's talking about justice. Look what it says. Luke 18 verses 1 and 8. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and what? Not lose 
heart. If somebody read in their Bible, be discouraged. Men ought to pray and be discouraged. Say, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, what's she, what's she calling out for? Get justice for me. From who? From my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward, he said within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will what? What does the judge say? Because she doesn't give up. She keeps, she's not losing heart. She's not been discouraged. She's crying out for justice. She keeps coming back over and over and over again. What does the judge say? I will avenge her. You know what another word for that is? I will bring to her justice. Lest by her continually coming, she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not, here it is again, what's that word say? Shall God not avenge, shall God not bring justice to his own elect who cry out day and night to him though he bears long with them I tell you that he will avenge them speedily nevertheless when the son of man comes will he really find faith on the earth how many know we can call out to God for justice how many know God will bring justice to your life? How many of you know that God had a plan for justice? Now, we're going to get into this next week, but I want to ask you a question as I close. And we're getting ready to pray for Diane and, and Bonnie, but I, I just want to submit a thought to you, okay? Is it possible that you have prayed for God to do something in your life? You have called out to God and you've said, God, I need help. I need a miracle. Lord, I need your intervention. And you do not get an answer. You've prayed more than once and you are despondent because you are asking for God to do something. You're literally, literally you're asking for God to render a verdict in your life to make a judgment and you're not hearing him answer. Could it be because the answer that he would give you because he's a just God would be not what you're wanting? Could it be that he's not answering because your heart's not right? Could it be that you're in rebellion or you're running from God and so he's not answering because of his justice he would have to render a verdict that you do not want? Everybody say, he has a plan. I'm going to read this to you. I'm going to read just a few verses, but I want to read the last verse as we close. Isaiah 59. I'm going to read the first four verses, and then I'm going to start skipping because of time. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity and your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. Verse 4. No one calls for justice nor does any plead for truth. Verse 8. The way of peace they have not known, and there is no justice in their ways. Verse 9, therefore justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. Verse 14, justice is turned back, and righteousness stands afar. Truth is fallen in the street. Verse 15, so truth fails, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it and displeased him, and there was no justice. 
verse 20. The Redeemer will come from Zion. I want to just say this as we close today. Do you remember when the angels of the Lord were going to Sodom? Do you remember they stopped and they said, should we hide from Abraham what is about to happen? Since he is going to command and teach his children, his household, and generations the ways of God. He's going to teach them to walk in righteousness and justice. And then later on in Isaiah 59, this same people, no justice is found. Truth has fallen in the street. There's no justice. I hear no justice in them. And verse 20 ends with, the Redeemer will come to Zion. I cannot have justice in my own strength. I cannot operate in my own justice. I will fail every time, but I need the blood of Jesus to come. I need the blood of Jesus. I need the Redeemer to come and wash me and cleanse me and restore me and renew me that I operate not in my own justice. My justice will steal a Brock's candy and eat it under a booth. Amen? But I need the blood of Jesus to come in and wash me and cleanse me where that I'm operating in the justice of the Lord. Would you stand with me all over this place? I ran to my mom. You remember the story. I ran to my mom. Mom, I, I stole that candy. My sister ran to my dad. Dad, a couple of different issues that happened there. But the result was the same. The result was there's mercy. There's mercy. Ira Stanfield sang a song years ago. There's room at the cross for you. There's room at the cross for you. Millions have come. There's still room for one. There's room at the cross for you. Father, we come today. Lord, maybe we have been off kilter. Maybe we've gone off bearing and we think we're sailing to the Hawaiian Islands, but we're going to be lost at sea. Father, we come to you and we say, Jesus, 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 I ask you to wash me. Jesus, I ask you to cleanse me. Jesus, I lay my sin at the foot of the cross. Broken as it may, I lay myself at the foot of the cross and I say, Jesus, wash me, cleanse me, restore me, renew me. Lord, I can't make it on my own. But Lord, I can walk in your justice because God, you're a just God and you're a God who loves justice and you require it. So Father, I run to you and I say cleanse me. I run to you and I say wash me. And Father, let us be a people of justice. Father, in a world that's crying out for humanistic justice that never works, let us be a people that walk in the justice of God, that we would speak for those who have no voice, and we would set at liberty those who are oppressed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. You love the Lord? Yes. Bonnie, come up here. Diane, come up here. We're going to pray over these women. I'm telling you right now, there was an anointing of God when Freddie was here. I'm envious of going, but I rebuke that, and I will not be jealous. <laughs> Amen? I want some women of God to come up around these women. And then I want some of you to stretch your hands out for them right, to them right now. I believe this. Hear me. I say this ever, ever so often. I say this, but I want to say this to you right now. I believe the strength of a church is not in its seating capacity. 
I believe the strength of the church is in its sending capacity. It's not about seats. It's about sending. Amen? Would you just stretch your hand out to these ladies right now? They're heading to Kenya, Africa, and it will not be the only visit. It's just going to be a beginning of a relationship with this ministry, this founder of orphanages, and this, this literally of an apostle to churches. Father, we pray for Bonnie and Diane. We cover them in the blood of Jesus. We surround them and circle them in the blood of the Lamb. Father, go before them. Be their rear guard, and as your word says, Holy Spirit, go alongside them. Cover them in your mercy. Cover them in your truth. Father, I pray the favor of the Lord right now on both of them. Lord, if there's any roadside stops, if there's any checkpoints, Father, I pray the favor of God upon them. Father, blind the eyes of the security, and Lord, go with them and go before them, and Lord, get them through every obstacle the enemy would try to set up. We pray it now. We pray it now. And Father, I pray a multiplica multiplied multiplication of anointing on their life. Father, now, just pray it into them right now. Lord, anoint them, anoint them, anoint them, anoint them. Both of them, Bonnie and Diane, right now, you're going to do things you didn't even know you were going to do over there. You're going to see miracles that you didn't even imagine you were going to see. And so we pray a blessing, an apostolic anointing on both these women of God in the name of Jesus. Lord, there's going to be a relationship here with these orphanages. We're going to bless children. We're going to get some of these girls from the Hope Center. When they graduate, we're going to send them to Kenya, Africa to be in an orphanage in Jesus' name. I don't even know if we can do that legally, but we can be about You just got to make sure you get graduated first. Amen? Father, bless them in Jesus' name. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? If you need to go, God bless you. If you want to come up here and, and pray over Bonnie or... Pray over Diana. We just open that up to you. But God bless you. God bless you. 